for to everyone for coming on a um, rather rain-drenched day, um, but that hasn't dampened anyone's spirits. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you all to the first of the Hochelaga Lectures for 2017. The Hochelaga Lectures are, were started to commemorate the interests of the anonymous benefactor. There have been a wide range of Hochelaga speakers, from the very first Hochelaga speaker, Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin of, of Canada, to the most recent Hochelaga sp uh, speaker in uh, um, October last year, that's Chief Justice James Alsop of the Federal Court of Australia. Today, we have uh, Professor Luke Nottage from Sydney Law School, and he will be speaking on a topic related to invest investor state arbitration. Um, Professor Nottage. Well, thank you to the University of Hong Kong, um, which is uh, since last year one of Sydney University's strategic research partners. Uh, uh, and also, of course, to Professor Ray for inviting me, kindly involved me in his uh, book project on the developing world of arbitration, uh, published through Hart soon. Um, and he's kindly contributing to a book uh, I'm editing uh, for Brill on uh, investment treaties and arbitration across Asia. Um, and it's a particular honor to be uh, involved in this. Uh, Hochelaga lecture series tonight. Um, before I begin on my topic uh, on investment treaty arbitration, uh, focusing on claims over tobacco regulation, um, I'd be interested to know a little bit about your personal backgrounds and interests in this topic. Um, so in a minute, I'll ask you to put up your hands, if you wouldn't mind, uh, if, uh, if your main background or interest is first uh, foreign investment issues generally, secondly uh, arbitration, um, thirdly public health issues so toba and tobacco um, industry related matters in general. So uh, if you uh, are particularly interested in foreign investment generally, could you put up your hands? Just one, don't be shy, two, three, four, five, thank you. Um, what about arbitration? Right, so significantly more. And lastly, public health or tobacco, so fairly uh, equally spread in that respect. Well, good. Um, I have quite a lot of material and to cover tonight, uh, so um, I will try to give you a a taste based on the sort of interest um, and then leave enough time for um, uh, questions and answers. I think that'll be more fruitful. Uh, so I won't go through every single thing I'm going to do. Um, that's the point of a PowerPoint, just make some powerful short points. So um, I, what I want to do, talk about today is, of course, Australia's tobacco plain packaging law. Um, and, and the challenges that it uh, attracted uh, from tobacco companies um, over the years. Uh, and, uh, but I also want to talk about uh, another perhaps less well-known uh, challenge to tobacco regulation uh, which was brought uh, against Uruguay. And then thirdly, talk about some broader implications from these uh, disputes. Um, so, Put up your hand if you're familiar with Australia's tobacco control regulations. Anyone, anyone been to Australia recently and tried to buy some cigarettes? Um, well, uh, to, to back, the tobacco regulation in Australia um, is hearing quite novel. Um, the scheme announced in uh, April 2010 and then enacted the following year um, uh, basically, not only it goes beyond just having health warnings and even graphic health warnings um, on the tobacco packaging themselves, but actually goes this next step of um, getting rid of the logos, trademarks, and so on, and having a uniform drab sort of olive colored uh, packaging like you see here um, from. Uh, 
Sydney Morning Herald article. Uh, it's actually, if you look carefully, um, uh, got reference to Winfield, not the Philip Morris Marlborough brand. <laughs> but uh, so the journalists are confused about this case. But um, as well as the drab um, packaging, uh, there are restrictions in terms of the font and uh, can be used to uh, identify the brand um, and the type of cigarette. Um, and this enactment in 2011, uh, first of all, generated a constitutional challenge under the Australian Federal Constitution, um, which was rejected in October 2012 by the High Court of Australia, realising um, that uh, although the Federal Constitution has a protection uh, requiring compensation for a direct expropriation, say where the government uh, takes your home or other tangible property rights for itself, so a direct expropriation, there's no protection under the Australian Federal Constitution for an indirect expropriation where the value of your property rights is diminished but the government doesn't take those rights themselves. Um, so there's no equivalent under Australian constitutional law to the takings doctrine under the US um, Constitution. Um, so that claim against pretty much all the tobacco brought by the, all the tobacco companies in Australia in relation to the plain packaging law uh, was unsuccessful in domestic law. Um, but Philip Morris um, brought an investor state arbitration claim under the old Australia-Hong Kong Bilateral Investment Treaty, um, which uh, was eventually rejected in December 2015 on jurisdictional grounds. Um, and the main argument that was upheld on the part of uh, the Australian government was that the Philip Morris Asia restructuring, whereby the rights to the trademarks and other intellectual property rights um, uh, that were affected by the plain packaging law, um, those uh, rights were held, restructured so that they were held by the Philip Morris Asia subsidiary in Hong Kong. Uh, and the arbitral tribunal found that this restructuring was solely for the purpose of bringing the ISTS claim and therefore constituted an abuse of rights under background international law uh, and therefore uh, jurisdiction uh, to proceed with the merits hearing on that case. Now there is another uh, pending uh, dis dispute going on in a different forum again which is in the World Trade Organization. Uh, various tobacco producing and exporting countries have brought claims against uh, Australia um, under the TRIPS agreement, Trade Related Intellectual Property Rights Agreement. Um, uh, and there is a leaked draft panel decision, first instance decision, um, uh, indicating that Australia has prevailed uh, on the merits in that case, um, but we haven't seen the final award uh, decision of the panel, and then it may well be appealed to the appellate body so that case is ongoing. Um, let's take a closer look at the Philip Morris Asia and Australia investor state arbitration case, in particular uh, award of December 2015, the tribunal rejected. Um, this is based on a case note that uh, Jared Hepburn and I wrote for the Journal of World Investment and Trade last year. Um, and as we stated there, uh, up front in that case note, um, this Philip case has been seen as epitomizing all that's wrong with investor-based ISDS. The newspaper reporting in uh, other commentary on this case tends to see this as a case of an unlikable pseudo-American multinational operation invoking a little-known treaty and an opaque uh, uh, arbitral procedure to claim billion-dollar damages arising from 
legislation enacted to protect public health. So that's the sort of perception we have, um, particularly in Australia, of this sort of, uh, of this case in particular. Um, what actually happened though? Well, um, a very eminent tribunal was formed. Uh, we had uh, Professor Kaufman Kohler appointed by the claimant tobacco company uh, and incidentally a recent uh, empirical analysis of investor uh, state arbitrators uh, puts Professor Kaufman Kohler from the University of Geneva, Geneva sort of in the number one spot actually uh, worldwide in terms of her influence on the field. Um, uh, Australia appointed uh, Professor Don McRae from who is now an Ottawa University, but originally from my country, England, so we'll claim him as a New Zealander. Uh, and uh, they agree, the, the agreed chair was Professor Birkstiegel from Germany, uh, who's also very experienced and eminent in this field. Um, and they had to deal with Australian preliminary objections on jurisdiction, um, which were actually uh, threefold. They first uh, objected that um, the investment that Philip Morris Asia, the Hong Kong subsidiary, had ended up holding in um, electricity rights in Australia was illegal under uh, the foreign direct investment law applicable uh, in Australia, the domestic law. The tribunal rejected um, that argument from Australia. Um, one rather unfortunate uh, piece of evidence uh, against the Australian position was that the Treasury, uh, the Federal Treasury, which was responsible for screening these had issued, as is the usual practice in the, your, your regular um, uh, foreign direct investment applications, a, a no objection letter. Uh, had case by, uh, uh, an application by a tobacco company um, after the announcement of path-breaking new tobacco plane packaging regulation. Um, and so the tribunal picked up on these sorts of factors for saying, well, no, uh, the investment was made uh, at sufficient disclosure and ticking of the boxes to qualify as uh, an, uh, an under properly under the uh, national law. Um, the lesson, of course, is, you know, if you've got national law, you should uh, enforce it properly to check foreign direct investment applications and use the discretion if it's under the foreign investment law of your own country to reject uh, investments that you don't think are going to be uh, in the long-term interests or even short-term interests of your uh, country. Um, on jurisdiction which was rejected again by the tribunal was uh, based on an objection that the dispute uh, had already arisen before the investment was made in February. And the tribunal said no, um, the dispute uh, actually crystallised when the law was enacted in 2011. So this left only um, objection to jurisdiction, which is the one, as I mentioned, where Australia prevailed. Um, the tribunal agreed the restructuring um, was solely for the purpose of bringing the ISDS claim under provisions in that old treaty. Uh, this was an abuse of rights where at the time the investment was made, February 2011, it was reasonably foreseeable that the, um, uh, that the dispute would arise. So, uh, because the enactment was made in eventually in um, late 2011, it was foreseeable that uh, foreseeable at that stage that um, the, the case would generate a dispute, and so restructuring in that scenario was um, an abuse of rights because it was uh, designed to bring an ISDS claim when the dispute was foreseeable. Uh, and um, 
important because it's, it's a set of quite an important principle because there have been some other cases um, that had used a slightly different test um, for uh, when a, an abuse of rights uh, arose. Uh, some other tri earlier tribunals had said it, it, had, it uh, had to be uh, almost probable that a dispute would arise for this to amount to an abuse of rights. So here the tribunal stated if it was merely reasonably foreseeable that a dispute would arise, it would amount to an abuse of rights. Um, so that essentially ended the, uh, ended the case. Um, uh, there was a subsequent uh, decision on costs uh, to be awarded, which I'll touch on in a minute. Um, touch significance of this case and what we can learn from it. Uh, in particular, in relation to some of the um, broader concerns that have been expressed about treaty-based arbitration more generally. Um, uh, the first is delay. How long did, did this case actually take? Well, if you calculate it from the commencement of the arbitration through to the decision rejecting jurisdiction um, on December 2015, it's four years. If you then add on uh, the period to get the costs award and have that published, which is only very quickly, it stretches out to 5.5. Uh, but let's say, you know, between four or five years, how does that actually compare with uh, the average, say, in ISDS cases? And um, actually, uh, um, has done a very nice study of uh, some of the ISDS cases. Found that, for example, it, it takes about 3.2 years on the tribunal to dismiss jurisdiction. Um, a bit longer, of course, to resolve questions on the merits. Um, so, the Philip Morris Asia case is a bit longer uh, than average, uh, but on the other case, uh, where a lot was at stake, um, not just financially, potentially worth, uh, you know, over a, over a billion dollars for Australia, but also in terms of the principles, public health implications as well. Um, interestingly, um, the case would have gone on even longer if Australia had prevailed in an argument it made, seemingly counterintuitively, um, of the arbitration should be in London, England, rather than Singapore, which was the uh, proposal, counter-proposal, for the preferred seat of the arbitration brought by Philip Morris, Asia. Um, and th this implication <laughs> arises because in England, all rule that it doesn't have jurisdiction, that can also be a local courts the seat. So no doubt uh, Philip Morris would have been tempted to to the English courts at London asking for this decision uh, jurisdiction to be reviewed. Um, and then if they it would you know the arbitration would have uh, resumed. Um, whereas in Singapore at that time the applicable law was the Unstral Model Law and arbitration as an in Singaporean law only allowed appeals to the local courts of the seat if the arbitrators made a positive ruling on jurisdiction, which we didn't have here in this case. Subsequently, actually, Singapore has amended its law <laughs> to allow also appeals to the court um, for negative jurisdic jurisdictional rulings by arbitrators. Um, uh, at the time, uh, Singapore only allowed a Court review only allowed court review for um, uh, positive jurisdictional rulings. Now, yes, and still a bit unclear why Australia was for arbitration in London um, or the seat in London, um, apart from the fact that some of the uh, outside counsel happened to be based in London and that and the English courts had had at that stage some.
limited experience in actually dealing with cases that had involved investment treaty arbitration rather than regular commercial arbitration. Um, because the downside would have been <laughs> that um, if they prevailed, as they did in their challenges to jurisdiction, there would have been further delays as the matter was then in the British courts. Secondly, what about the costs involved in this case? Now, uh, around about the time that the jurisdictional ruling in Australia's favour was due to come out, or when, when, then when it was when it did come out, there started to be reports that the Australian government had spent 50 in this investor state arbitration. Um, you know, and as Dr. Uh, Hepburn and I case note, which we're working up for this lecture series uh, publication, that would put, you know, the third in this case well out of the usual matters. So again, some statistical research shows that uh, the ISDS uh, case average for costs is 4.5 million spent in party costs, uh, primarily for the lawyers involved. Uh, but also expert witness evidence uh, uh, costs, which, you know, in cases involving public health are uh, quite significant. So, you know, you need to look at uh, a wide range of uh, um, public health-related data and patients. Um, uh, and uh, we know Philip and Uruguay exit award um, that uh, the response spent $10 million, um, so more than the average, um, but nothing like $50 million. Uh, unfortunately, we are, we are still unsure how much the Australian government did incur on this case, uh, because the final on costs only came out uh, a few weeks ago, uh, heavily redacted. It had been issued by the tribunal to the parties on the 8th of March this year, uh, that then took to redact out um, at the request of one or both parties um, uh, uh, the actual figures uh, of the costs involved. Um, but uh, from one of the redacted paragraphs where Philip Morris Asia's claims are summarised by the tribunal, um, they summarised the argument as being that in NAFTA cases involving North American free trade agreement cases defended by Canada and the US, the maximum limit ever been claimed was a million US dollars. So we can perhaps infer that the Australian government in this case claim, was claiming more than that, had spent more than that, and therefore was claiming more, as, more than that as the successful party in this arbitration. Um, uh, but we don't know how much more. Uh, but I seriously doubt it's anything like $50 million because that, the, you know, that would be in the category of the colossal UCOS <laughs> investor state arbitration, which took It was much, much more complicated. Um, uh, what we do know from the costs award, though, was that uh, there was a proportion deducted by the arbitrators um, uh, because uh, the tribunal said Australia sp spent far too much time, put on far too much evidence, including law in Australia, to what the legal framework for admitting foreign investments. Um, so that argument, the very first argument they put up against uh, to contest jurisdiction, too much time on, and um, so they couldn't for the, the for that work done. Uh, by their lawyers or even their expert witnesses, including a former treasurer, uh, Wayne Swan, who appeared as witness to explain the operation of his own law. <laughs> Those expenses against the unsuccessful Philip Morris uh, claimant. Um, the third issue that's often uh, been uh, worrying for those following the developments in Vesta State Arbitration is transparency or openness of the uh, proceedings. Um, early on, uh, along with the determination by the trial, the seat being Singapore um, and other 
procedural orders, the uh, Australia was able to um, order the release of all documents uh, in the arbitration, um, subject to redactions for reasons of either business sensitivity or public interest sensitivity on the part of the host state. So the principle, this, the general principle was full transparency. Um, unfortunately, you see, from what I've just mentioned in relation to the costs award, um, one or more parties, and probably more likely actually the uh, Australian government, <laughs> subsequently seems to have argued that some of the defending this case uh, has been redacted out and accepted by the tribunal. Um, uh, and another uh, rather disappointing aspect was that um, Australia decided not to release um, the uh, full statement of defence in relation to the merits that they had, um, which I'll get on to uh, uh, somewhat when I talk about the separate claim against Uruguay. Um, and it could potentially be an appropriate advantage to the countries that were bringing claims against Australia in the parallel WTO proceedings, um, which is understandable. Um, if you've got multiple forums going on, you have to be aware of those uh, interactions. But the transparency. Um, finally, the third concern, that, the fourth concern that's often raised in relation to the um, SBAC chill. In other words, uh, the potential for uh, measures, um, say, enacted for public health purposes, not to be proceeded with because of a fear of a ISDS claim. Um, now, it's very hard to prove because you're trying to prove, find examples where the host state hasn't proceeded with something, so nothing happened, that the measure didn't exist or come into existence um, because of this threat of an ISDS claim. Um, you know, and I mean, it's true that in the uh, Philip Morris. Some countries have announced that they're going to follow this path of enacting packaging legislation. So New Zealand is one example. Um, on the other hand, when you think this claim failed on jurisdiction, not on the merits, right? And um, the defense of Australia wasn't made public. So it's not a great example to say, well, New Zealand deferred putting, you know, deferred enacting plain packaging legislation, therefore they were subject to regulatory chill because really if, if regulatory chill existed, they should have waited, say, until a merits defence or at least the upcoming decision on the WTO disputes which went straight to the merits, not to jurisdiction, and then enacted. New Zealand went ahead with plain packaging legislation even after just the jurisdictional award. So. Um, so it's hard to use this case to either prove or disprove reg the regulatory chill, I think. Um, moving on <laughs> to Philip Morris and Uruguay. This was earlier uh, in relation to more traditional um, tobacco control measures enacted by Uruguay in 2008-2009. One was a single presentation requirement saying that uh, you were only allowed one variant per brand. So, for example, Marlboro Red or Winfield Blue, uh, but not multiple uh, variants on the theory that this confuses consumers or creates uh, you know, an artificial incentive market for excessive cigarette consumption. Um, and the so-called 8080 regulation, which required that uh, had gra graphic uh, warnings and so on covering 80% of the package, uh, much more than the previous regulation. Um, this was brought by Swiss companies because Philip Morris is headquartered now in Switzerland, although originally a US company, um, and it's Uruguay subsidiary company. Um, claimant uh, spent $16 million in party costs, mainly lawyers' costs, other experts. 
this cost to bring this claim, which the tribunal noted was more than what they were claiming in terms of their lost sales in the market due to these, um, these uh, measures. Um, uh, Bondon, as I've mentioned, $10 million, uh, which they were able to claim back $7 million because they successfully won the case, not only on, on the merits, rather than jurisdiction. The eminent tribunal, uh, including actually Australia's and uh, international lawyer, Professor James Crawford, on the International Court of Justice. Um, they rejected the claim on the merits. First, they found no expropriation of the property rights uh, of Philip Morris, and secondly, no breach of fair and equitable treatment or any denial of justice in the Uruguayan courts. So I just want to pick out here, in the remaining time, five minutes, the... Um, well-known tribunal, um, first in relation to expropriation. So, in terms of indirect expropriation, the tribunal emphasized that this only arises if there's a substantial deprivation of the property rights um, and um, uh, had a, didn't have such a profitability of the Philip Morris subsidiary. Um, more importantly, uh, the tribunal said that uh, under law, uh, there is a police powers exception uh, anyway if these are, there are bona fide measures for public health and welfare, discriminatory and proportionate, um, even if there's then a substantial deprivation of property rights there's no grounds for claiming indirect expropriation. Um, and another important in this case was to help re in reaching this conclusion, and in this case generally, the tribunal used its discretion to allow amicus curiae briefs, including some, for example, um, to, to reach their decision. So these are things that uh, are very useful in acting. Uh, and yes, uh, like this. Um, what about the argument that there was uh, a fair and equitable treatment? Well, this was again rejected by the tribunal. Uh, they found that uh, in relation to variness, um, uh, the tribunal held that uh, these were reasonable when the measure was adopted addressed a real health concern, they were proportionate, they were in bad faith. Um, uh, and the majority of the tribunal, two out of three, even went as far as uh, of, to adapt uh, the so-called margin of appreciation given by the European Court of Human Rights in uh, claims involving human rights, including expropriation and lack of due process, um, and said that tribunals, even should pay great deference to government judgments in matters such as the protection of public health. Now, this is something that's been said in other tribunals, like the uh, case involving Electra Bell, Glamis, uh, in, in the context and so on. Um, but uh, again, something that's potentially um, very useful for host states uh, to defend themselves against uh, these sorts of claims. Um, Another argument that was run as part of the alleged violation of fair and equitable treatment uh, guarantees given in the investment treaty in this case was that there had been a violation of substantive legitimate expectations and stability of the regulatory regime. And here again, the tribunal, in comments that are very useful, they said, well, invest in a, in a sector that is historically highly regulated or, and is on the trend of more and more regulation, uh, you should expect even more. Um, you don't have a substantive, substantive legitimate expectation then that, you know, that there's not going to be any further <laughs> action. Um, the host state made no specific undertakings, uh, so you couldn't rely on that either. And the tribunal also mentioned that um, in relation to public health measures, um, host states are entitled to be first movers and attempt some things that haven't been tried anywhere else, if they're acting in good faith, not intentionally, and adopting a proportionate sort of measure. 
Um, so, uh, and finally, there was a, 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 an argument that objections, uh, objections raised by Philip Morris in the court amounted to a denial of justice, um, which again is an aspect of customer international law. Uh, and again, the tribunal set a very uh, a denial of justice to show a fundamentally unfair local court proceeding and an outrageous decision. And I won't go into detail given the time and two particular arguments brought by Philip Morris here were rejected by the tribunal to meet that high, high standard or threshold for finding a denial of justice. Um, so what are the implications for the re more generally from these two cases? Um, this is a, a heat map, um, appropriately for the weather today. Um, so, uh, and what it shows in red uh, are uh, parts of investment treaties that preserve a large amount of um, discretion uh, or host state regulatory space measures such as public health measures like we see in these cases. Um, and it's a, bit, it's a map of all the treaties concluded between the Trans-Pacific Partnership signatories, or the original ones, including the US. Um, and what you find is that uh, if you break these down and, and look uh, more detail at the factors that drive more red, which is more pro-host state type uh, provisions, um, they are very much, uh, influenced by contemporary U.S. drafting. So the more recent U.S. treaties, um, since uh, the, in particular the USA model uh, investment uh, treaty of 2012, but even the earlier one of 2004, um, and free trade agreements in the Asia-Pacific region, which have uh, adopted that sort of treaty language, treaty drafting, such as obviously US FTAs, but also Australia's FTAs, for example, the Australia-Chile FTA is right up there in terms of having a lot of similarity to the TPP, which in turn has a lot of similar, a lot of state drafting built into it. Um, you know, you can see a, a, a progression away from own original early bilateral treaty language towards um, more uh, elaborate treaty language provides for a lot more um, state regulatory space in these more comprehensive FTAs that have an investment chapter. And it's very much driven by not only being an F FTA, but also uh, having the party or even being an Asia-Pacific nation where even if you don't have an FTA with the US, like New Zealand, for example, still hasn't got an FTA with the US because the US now has withdrawn its signature from the TVP. Um, but New Zealand's treaty drafting has adopted that US style, has evolved to that US style of uh, treaty drafting. So it builds in these treaty provisions. Um, well, um, what these decisions, though, on the in, uh, from the Philip Morris cases show is that you don't necessarily have to build into the treaty all those uh, extra express provisions preserving state regulatory space. Because whether it's in relation to jurisdictional objections, matters of procedure, and so on, uh, experienced arbitrators can and readings of older treaties uh, to achieve the sort of outcomes that have tried to be entrenched through more precise treaty drafting. Um, uh, and in fact, uh, some empirical research by Langford and Bain that I've uh, referred to here uh, um, shows how the decisions of investment tri tribunals over the last 10 to 15 years have been deciding markedly, significantly more in favour of host states. Um, and yet those treaty claims, we know from UNCTAD and other data, um, really involve the of treaties that don't have the sort of expressly more pro-host state uh, 
provisions like the epitomized in the TPP and other Asia Pacific contemporary that expressly preserve the state regulatory space. Um, and so I think it's, it's arisen because we have more experienced arbitrators uh, who are uh, interpreting these treat even older treaty texts uh, and more or, or proficient in using the background general international law principles to um, so that's something a bit comforting for those especially who've been concerned that, you know, uh, with these literally thousands of investment treaties out there, there's a uh, liability and regulatory chill impacting on... on um, but that's not to say that we shouldn't, you know, uh, look to get rid of those older treaties and restate them in more contemporary forms like we see in more modern free trade agreements. Um, uh, and um, the, the final point I want to make is that I think, though the, these these final these Philip Morris cases, both of them deserve a much wider press, um, especially the Uruguay award, um, because uh, I did a little uh, statistical analysis. It won't be easy to to see, but um, in Australia, that's the bottom half of this graph. Uh, newspapers uh, got very excited in reporting, of course, on the Philip Morris case uh, in 2015 when we had the decision rejecting jurisdiction. Um, there was, it was in that year there were over 100 uh, news reports re referring to ISTS. A lot of them referring to uh, Philip Morris uh, it's, itself. So you know, over 50. Uh, the second blue bar on the uh, bottom part. Uh, but almost nothing on the Philip Morris and Uruguay Award, which came out in 2016. Even though, as I've just explained, it was a decision on the merits, like the sorts of things that would have been considered the arbitral tribunal if Australia hadn't won on, prevailed on jurisdiction at the first stage, uh, with potentially a lot more impact for you know, Australia's future direction in terms of enacting other public health or other governmental measures. But no reporting. Um, and my only conclusion is bad news sells, not good news. <laughs> um, and so it's very, and it's also quite psychological uh, as well as political that we don't find enough reporting on the Philip Morris and that case because I think that's more significant potentially, not just for Australia but for other countries. Um, and by the way, is, is Hong Kong's newspaper reporting? And I was rather surprised to find there's no reporting on the, of either of these Philip Morris cases. Um, and even uh, very little on investor state dispute settlement. So I'd like to end there and uh, ask you to enlighten me uh, as to you know, the uh, interest or lack thereof of the media and general public, presumably, in Hong Kong on investor state arbitration. Thank you, and I'm sorry for taking up so much time. Thank you very much. Professor Nottage has uh, kindly agreed to um, take questions. Um, we can uh, start now with uh, whatever questions um, the audience might have. I noticed that uh, some of you were taking photos of the um, PowerPoint slides. Uh, note that the PowerPoint slides will be uploaded to the CCPL uh, website so that they should all be available there, as will, uh, in, in due course, a text of uh, Professor Nottage's lecture this evening. So, are there questions? Yes. Uh, Peter, you a professor at Texas A&M University. So, um, I enjoy your talk a lot, and my question is mainly about your first set of conclusions. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you talk about how we need to address about delays as well as cost, ah, yes. and the proposal is a 2T investment mm -hmm. court perhaps similar to the EU proposal mm -hmm. for the TTIP, mm -hmm. and so I'm curious as to how that actually will play out because you get more process, but you end up spending more time and incurring more cost. Mm -hmm. And a related issue that's about the LSEP, uh, you mentioned that there should be more leadership from Australia mm -hmm. and perhaps from New Zealand. And I'm curious as to what you have in mind in terms of what they can push for mm -hmm. in terms of LC, uh, LSEP negotiations. Thank you. Great questions. Um, and uh, allows me to go back on some slides that I skipped over in light of time. Um, starting with the... Uh, the uh, idea of an EU-style investment court um, 
rather than the traditional um, process of case-by-case um, -case appointments of arbitrators, uh, typically without any sort of uh, list or panel to choose from. So it's like each party, both claimant investor and host state respondent, chooses their own arbitrators and they tr typically try to agree on a chair and if they don't, the, def the uh, default appointing authority will appoint it. Um, the Philip Morris take case took a long time to form the tribunal. Um, the Philip Morris Asia against Australia case. Also the Uruguay case. Um, because, you know, everyone wants to have Professor Gabriel Kaufman Kola or, <laughs> you know, uh, Professor Bernardini uh, uh, as the chair and they're getting, they're, they're getting too busy. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's uh, uh, not, a, not a very efficient way of organising a tribunal, I don't think. Um, uh, but then there were other delays. Like there were a lot of procedural orders, like on transparency, like on the seat of the arbitration. Now, you know, some of these things we can build into treaties and the, the more modern treaties have express provisions which hopefully will, will, will speed up the process in relation to many of these things. Um, so, you know, that's not necessarily uh, a, a great argument for having a, a new type of sort of permanent investment court that's been proposed in the, by the EU and its FTAs uh, concluded with Vietnam, Canada, um, uh, and now proposed in their negotiations for the TTIP uh, free tra trade agreement with the US, um, uh, th this new sort of EU model. Um, but I think, you know, it's worth trying to, tr trying something new in this field. Um, I think the EU's main objective in proposing a system where in advance each state appoints a panel of arbitrators, uh, they call them, going to call them judges or whatever, uh, and then uh, it, it, uh, and then when a dispute, or if and when a dispute, that tribunal forms, uh, uh, appoints a, 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 the most judge the dispute first at uh, first instance, and then if there's an appeal to an appellate review uh, body, uh, also from this panel, uh, of pre-selected arbitrators from the, diff the two states. Um, you know, I think the EU, this EU model is uh, partly, if maybe even predominantly, aimed at appeasing a lot of public concern about the ad hoc ISDS arbitration, arbitrator appointment process and the fact in particular that um, uh, perhaps because the claimants appoint at least one arbitrator directly, uh, a lot of the arbitrators have backgrounds more from commercial law firms and so on and, and not necessarily expert in general public international law, which as we've seen in these cases are very important. Um, but I think there's a good chance that by having a more uh, systematic um, predetermined panel of arbitrators um, uh, and a, a new type of um, permanent court which could involve secretariat type assistance for these panel members, like we have in the um, appellate body and the double TO mechanism, could speed up the process. Because, you know, the double TO cases are taking longer these days as well, but they're, you know, on, on average quicker. Um, and get a lot, there's a lot, there's, it's much more institutionalized and it seems to function a lot better. And the appellate review mechanisms that, that's available in double TO um, used to, is only supposed to add another three months that's stretching out these days to more like six months. But it's not a big price to pay, I think, in terms of having a more institutionalized framework. I think it's, it's really worth considering that alternative model. But as I say here, um, uh, we, can, we don't need to go the whole hog uh, in terms of adopting this EU model. We can also think of some other aspects of that model to incorporate into contemporary treaties. And that's where I get to the next question, which is like, well, what's the role of countries in the region, including Australia, where I live now, or New Zealand, where I'm from originally? And I think, you know, uh, both those countries have been pretty reactive. Uh, we've we've um, 
shifted from the, B, the first generation bare bones, standalone BITs to more elaborate free trade agreements uh, with investment chapters that, that expressly write in sort of state regulatory space provisions and extra procedural uh, features uh, such as transparency obligations and so on, which um, uh, I think are, are very useful additions to the system. But we've basically just shifted from a, an originally European, Western European model of BITs to a US style model uh, um, in FTAs. Uh, and in an Australia's case, like when the Philip Morris Asia first case hit us, we sort of said, well, well we're not going to do ISDS provisions at all for a while. <laughs> well, their government at the time said, and then when they lost power, the next government said, oh, no, we're going to go back to our normal approach. Case by case, the ISDS provision. It's, it's again, very events and to, to part to what's happened in the past. And I think countries like Australia and New Zealand need to be a bit more forward thinking and, and sort of show a bit more leadership. The regional comprehensive economic partnership, ASEAN plus six FTA negotiations that have been going on probably too long, uh, but it, which are really important now that the TPP's future is, a bit un, is uncertain. Um, you know, I think Australia and New Zealand should sort of step up and say, okay, uh, from the experience of Philip Morris Asia against Australia or Philip Morris a against Uruguay for that matter, we need to try some new things and one of the possibilities is some sort of significant reform to the ISDS model. Um, and some of the other things uh, I've, I've skipped over in this slide in, were in relation to, you know, some of the other lessons um, from these two cases where Australia and New Zealand might uh, um, show a bit more leadership. Uh, for example, um, I think in RCEP, I think it's quite important that there be an express reference to, you know, treaty-protected investments being those uh, made in accordance with host state law. Um, maybe we need extra treaty wording, right? If, if you want to succeed in the sorts of arguments that Australia tried to make in front of the tribunal in the Philip Morris Asia case, to say, well, what does that mean, being in accordance with host state law? To what degree do you have to make full disclosure? Um, and so on. Um, the, the, uh, but certainly something expressed in the treaty, because in the TPP it was left out completely. Um, now, there's some tribunals that say, oh, we can go back to background public international law and, and say, well, of course, the, you know, otherwise it would be an abuse of rights if you uh, tried to bring a treaty claim. But I think that's an area where this case shows that uh, we should write it out expressly and maybe be a bit more, even more if that's what the, 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 the 16 parties to RCEP, you know, think is appropriate. But in particular, it's sort of incumbent on Australia that's had an experience with this sort of argument recently to put something forward rather than just, you know, leaving it out completely like in the TPP because that's the US. Or use the same old wording that we find in ASEAN treaties. Times, you know, we have more experience in these cases, so let's learn from it and, and push forward some uh, proposals. Um, uh, it may not end up in the final treaty text, um, but at least I think Australia and New Zealand have to become a bit more proactive in these sorts of negotiations. But I'm going to give a talk on Wednesday on that aspect if you want to learn more. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Mm. Uh, terminating BITs to remodel and then to remodel their BITs like what India and Indonesia mm. are doing. Do you think it is a solution or is it just a knee-jerk reaction? Mm. I think it would. It, it it does make sense to revisit the first generation of treaties because. We know from cases like Philip Morris and Asia that you can get results that, you know, the international law experts in the room would agree are appropriate and which, you know, probably the majority in the general public, if they knew fully about these cases, would think is the right result, but it, it does take too long. 
Um, and in the meantime, it, it leaves a lot of uncertainty, a lot of adverse media coverage and so on, which jeopardizes the, the conclusion of new agreements and, and which we know, I've done some econometrics, um, leads to a lot more cross-border investment, which we know leads to a lot more cross-border trade and, and which has brought whole countries out of poverty um, in the last few decades. So um, uh, we need to, I think, uh, revisit those old treaties. Um, and UNCTAD, the United Nations uh, body in charge of uh, investment uh, issues, um, has, has a range of of uh, approaching, um, you know, this revisitation and recalibration of the investment treaties in light of what we've seen evolve and is likely to continue to evolve. Um, but one of the main say the Indian uh, approach, which is we'll check all the treaties that uh, are open now for termination, send the notice of termination, um, and uh, actually Australia-India BIT is now terminated <laughs> um, because a, over a year ago India gave the requisite one year's notice um, and uh, you know, uh, but then what happens then for new investments? The existing investments are protected for another uh, depending on the treaty that's now terminated. But the new investments, um, you know, don't have treaty protection. Um, and so, uh, and, and yet we have this sort of econometric evidence that says the treaties enhance the cross-world investment flows. So I think, you know, you need to replace them with something. Um, and Australia and, and, and uh, India are negotiating a bilateral FTA. Um, but they should hurry up and 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 agree on it. Um, and but to agree on it, they're going to have to compromise. I think. I'm sure, Australia will be putting forward, you know, its latest treaty that it signed, uh, major treaty, the TPP type wording, right? Its new model BIT, which still retains ISDS, but has. Uh, says you have to spend five years exhausting your, your remedies in local Indian courts before you can even enter the narrow window that to bring your claim and after that it's time barred, you know. And, and so you've got to find some sort of compromise and that's why I'm sort of interested in the EU proposal or some hybrid version as a way to, to get an agreement because if you don't get an agreement on that, you, there's, there's, there's not a lot of point in having the investment uh, chapter commitments because they can't be readily enforced uh, or credibly enforced uh, and therefore you know you're not going to get the overarching FTA and then everyone's worst off it's sort of a pr prisoner's dilemma um, but I think uh, to answer another part of your question um, India's reaction although it's rational I think in, at, it, at, by saying we need to revisit the old BITs um, it is a bit reactive, right? Because it's a bit like uh, the Philip Morris case. First, radically shift, uh, shifting direction, um, which up till then in India's case was involved uh, signing lots of BITs with full-scale ISDS back protections, um, to saying, well, no, we've got this new model, take it or leave it. <laughs> And um, meanwhile, we're terminating all the old ones uh, that we can that we're able to terminate unilaterally, um, without yet agreeing to any substitute. Um, so it is uh, that aspect seems to be reactive, overreactive perhaps. Um, but the inclination, you know, I'm I'm quite uh, amenable to, you know, to try to revisit the old treaties. We'll take one more question. Li Tingyan. Professor. 
Mm -hmm. In relation to uh, the um, Clement's argument, mm. uh, because you said uh, uh, tribunal mm. uh, addressed this issue by referring to the European Court mm. of uh, Human Rights, mm. uh, in particular giving the margin of appreciation mm. uh, to the public authorities' um, power to regulate uh, on this aspect. Do you think uh, it is more influenced by the underlying uh, public health concern, or rather is an indication, indication of the general trend of the cross-fertilization of human rights law and law on um, international investment? Thank you. Another great question, thank you. Um, well, the majority of the tribunal in the Philip Morris and Uruguay case um, mentioned this, that they were, they, it was appropriate to apply a margin of appreciation in favour of the host state in terms of enacting measures, but they did limit it, as I put in quotes here, to matters such as the protection of public health, um, which, which leaves open the question, well, what other things <laughs> is it appropriate to have the margin of appreciation to, for? And, um, but the, the sorts of cases they were referring to uh, were not necessarily just about public health, where other tribunals have mentioned a margin of appreciation, right? Um, and so that would be the most obvious starting point to, to sort of uh, think about what they had in mind as, you know, the scope of application for this margin of appreciation. But I think it does go beyond public health. If you look at the European Court of Justice, uh, uh, Human Rights, of course, they're looking at all types of human rights uh, or... or uh, civic, civil rights, including actually, um, although for individual citizens and so on. So the, uh, uh, but it's a general principle for the European Court, right? Um, uh, although uh, uh, you'd have to check whether they tend to apply in relation to certain types of Thank you very much. I think there may be other questions, uh, but there are refreshments uh, served outside, um, so there will be an opportunity to discuss more intimately with uh, Professor Nottage outside over some coffee or tea or whatever other refreshments are. I, I, I don't believe the refreshments are alcoholic. Um, but in any event, um, uh, let us um, thank uh, Professor Nottage for his lecture and for the uh, stimulating thoughts about investor state dispute settlement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You should have given me the time. I was getting too excited.